Speaking of top stars, subject today is one of the top stars in the business of all time, one of the greatest of all time, Chris Jericho. Now, before we kind of get into him with WCW, just want to quickly mention just before that, obviously, you guys have to see him somewhere else to bring him in and him to get on your radar. So he, he did make a name for himself, obviously, in Canada, doing some of those death tours, working in Calgary, working the Rocky Mountain system over there in Canada, just working all over the Canadian Indies, makes a name for himself with FMW in Japan, the war promotion in Japan, um, CMLL in Mexico and some other Mexican promotions, war in Japan. So he is making his name other places and obviously ECW as well. So, I mean, he does make a name for himself elsewhere and really kind of builds himself up into something. And he's a great wrestler, great worker. When do you guys take notice of him? And like, how do you take notice of him? I think the one you left out, he was in smoke and mount too. Yes. Oh yes. Yep. I think that's when they saw him because he was so close. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Not uh, ECW, huh? It wasn't from ECW? You know, ECW was like people in the main main shot callers in the company weren't really looking at ECW except for special guys. Right. And then you know when he he they obviously noticed him there, but when he went to Cornette, he was so close. You know that bled over that TV bled over into uh, North Georgia, yep. so people got to see him. So I admire him. He's been a chameleon. He's been able to change his his status, whatever he wants. Uh, he keeps up with the times. Uh, he it is still a huge draw, huge draw for them. I was thinking about this the other day. If they ever lost him right now, they'd be bad shape. I'm not saying him leaving the company, but if he got hurt for any extended time, they'd feel it. Oh, yeah. When you look at it, when you guys are, are looking at him, and it's funny because people think, oh, ECW, they kind of invented the Attitude Era. So many people from WCW, and Bischoff included, didn't even know really about ECW as much as people thought they did. Like they weren't really watching that program. They weren't really readily available in, in so many places. The NWO is really the, the start of the attitude era. Even Russo who admits who was writing there at the time, even a bunch of the wrestlers admitted at the time they were stealing stuff from the NWO. And that's what created the attitude era, not ECW. I feel like so many people get that screwed up. Even guys in ECW have, have like a false sense of like, Oh, we started the attitude era because we were doing crazy stuff. It was more so, WCW and NWO that really created the Attitude Era. The NWO created the Attitude Era. I mean, you're right because ECW, as innovative as they were, were only seen in small markets. Yep. When I say that, you know, Philly is a big market and then they were in some uh smaller tvs in florida and then some in the midwest but when kevin and scott came in it changed the whole whole ball of wax it, from pay to what they could get away with. They pushed the line, you know? Yep. And if you look at uh, uh, the, uh, Shawn Michaels and Triple H, DX was a copycat of NWO. Big time. Yeah. It's funny, people think like they invented 
suck it and all this other stuff. Hall, remember Hall? But before any of that was doing the down here, and he kept going like this. Yeah. So they yeah. they just turned their hands this way and were copying Hall. They you know they took so much stuff from Hall and Nash that people don't even realize DX is a complete rip off the NWO. Yeah. Just total. With with Jericho though now, like looking at him now with AEW, he's you know arguably their biggest star. That they need him. But have you felt like the fans have turned on him a little bit with like this accusations of of stuff going on with him? Have you seen? Have you felt like maybe they're turning on him a little bit unjustly? Yeah, unjustly for sure. You know, in this country, we're innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, and usually when something like this happens and somebody's accused, then there's a flood of accusations. Well, there's been no flood of accusations. Yep. Do you know what I'm saying? Yep. The only so, thing that Tony said about it too, is he said, you can't listen to every unfounded rumor that doesn't have any evidence. And I kind of agree because people were upset with Tony Khan for not investigating, but he said, there's no evidence. Like you, we need something to go on. You can't just, make up a, a, a case out of nowhere and just go after people, right? So, I mean, Tony kind of had a good point. He did have a good point there, a very good point. Jericho, a few times on TV, they've been playing his music over when he's out because people are chanting stuff at him, NDA and all this weird stuff. Have you have you seen that, or do you think that's a little odd, like, re reaction by the crowd with the, you know, unjustified rumors? You know, we're a cancel culture now. We love to tear down our idols, you know? Yep. Uh, I think it's, you know, <laughs> they're unjustly, the fans are fickle enough, but they're not really unjust on this one with Chris. Until we find out more information, they should just cheer him and appreciate his ability. Before he heads back to WB for a nice little retirement tour and a Hall of Fame tour, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you guys know that, that Jericho definitely is a star, right? I mean, when you, when you bring him in, you're like thinking, okay, this guy has st or star potential when you guys first bring him in. Yeah, yeah. Did you like him like right off the bat and say, oh, I like this guy? Even though the gimmick was the lion heart, it was a little bit like of a corny baby face, but you liked him? You saw something in him? Oh, I, I saw something in him when he was with uh, Cornette when I'd go up there uh, like once a month, I'd see him, yeah. When you see him, do you see like his future as like a world champion thing, or are you just saying he, he's got a spot in the business in the future? I knew he'd be uh very good, but I didn't think he'd be this great as he's turned out to be. So he leaves ECW, heads to WCW, debuts, technically speaking, August 20th, 1996. He beats Mr. JL. His really, I guess, first televised WCW appearance would be August 26th against Alex Wright. Which ended in no contest. They would have a he would have a pay per view debut against Chris Benoit at Fall Brawl in '96. Loses to Benoit, but you could see it's like wow, okay, this guy's pretty good. You know, he's having good matches with. I mean, not that JL, Alex Wright, and Chris Benoit aren't all good, but just you could see right, it's like okay, we got something here. He fit in with them. Chris Jericho in WCW. Do you see cruiserweight champion? Do you see cruiserweight division right away? Because not necessarily yeah. by his matches, but just by <clears throat> what you guys are doing. What we're doing, plus he fit in great with the cruiserweights we had at the time. They were still in the show. You look at, you know, obviously, Mr. JL, not that he was a big part of it, but he was obviously on the roster. Alex Wright, Benoit, Malenko, Six. And, you know, eventually, obviously, Mysterio is there in Psychosis. So, I mean, that cruiserweight division is absolutely stacked with talent movie yep uh, uh, la paca you can go down the list keep going down you know what i mean yep it was great fabulous changed the wrestling business totally agree it's so many you know styles have copied it today basically 
Yeah, and so many smaller guys. Yep. You think maybe even sometimes for the worst, because we don't see a lot of big men main eventing as maybe as much as we used to. Is that bad? Well, it's not bad, but there's something different when you see Roman, right? And you see Ganta and you see Brock. And I guess you throw Cody in there too. It just looks different. You know what I mean? Yep, totally agree. To me, anyway, I, I totally agree. But the cruiserweights were such a big part of WCW and such a big part of, of television, really, for, for everything you guys did. I feel like Jericho fit in like a glove with, with those guys. Yeah, and see, the thing is, before then, we would go way back in the 50s. There were territories that were junior heavyweight territories. Oklahoma, Ohio, uh, the secondary, uh, I told you about the two, ter ter two territories in Boston, right? Yep. The Sa Santos was, had a lot of cruiserweights. So it's been always there, but then it was lost with the, with the gigantic guys that came in later, right? And that's what I think if you don't study history, look at the 80s. That was excess to the max, right? Yep. Whether it was the guys, Hollywood starlets, I mean, you know, from... Uh, uh, Pamela Anderson to Jenny McCarthy, you know what I mean? Everything was bigger than life. And the era was wide open. And now I, I, like, I really like the idea that guys don't have to use steroids. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say I never took them. I took them. But I think that, you know, that range of deaths we had in the late 80s and 90s, it, it was... It weakens the heart. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Not if you're on like testosterone replacement, you know, and that sort of things. But guys were taking enormous amounts. They were taking monthly doses in two days, you know. Yep. It, so I'm glad to see the health thing in and uh, it almost looks strange when you see someone really jacked, right? Yep, nowadays. Yeah, it, yeah, it looks like, whoa, you know, that's out of place. I mean, you know, we, I'm going to jump around here. You know, we were talking about The Rock coming back. I just, we were had that break for a while, I flipped on uh, the, the stocks today. The, their stock jumped considerably. I don't know the percentage, but it was a huge jump, okay? Now, it, I know the $5 billion contract was some of it. I think some of it has to go to The Rock, too. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Now, that's 
the wrestling business. Now, wrestling entertainment. What do you do if it is the Rock and Roman for a finish? Roman's got to go over now. I would think so, but they just gave him, what did you say, $30 billion in stocks? Yes, $30 million, yeah. If you money. writing a check for a guy for thirty million dollars, just to have him on board, his first time being seen in a championship match since when Seattle with Stone Cold with that kind of magnitude, right? Mm -hmm. Do yep. you beat the Rock? I don't know. I feel like Roman can't lose, though. I feel like. I, I feel he can't either on the entertainment side. Now we're talking about the guy that is the head of TKO, right? Yep. Who knows nothing about wrestling, really, probably, right? right? The other part of the equation is UFC, which is real, right? And they go and push, they're trying to get Connor back into fight. He's going to fight again, right? Yep. You know that he they're not going to give him anybody very tough the first time out. It's going to put them in a situation where they're going to have to come up with some real creative stuff. And what I thought was, could the match with Rock and Roman end up Rock and Roman during the match before the finish? We'll say the Rock has Roman covered and the rest of the bloodline hit and they end up fighting against the bloodline. I don't, like, cool. I don't like non-finishes, especially at WrestleMania. But you know everybody from the accountants on going to be at that show. Yep, They're gonna, no doubt. And I, I, I'll tell you this. I know Hunter will come up with an incredible finish. I'm really looking forward to that. What if the Rock had Roman beat in the bloodline hit on the other side? And down comes Cody, and Cody saves the Rock, and they fight them off. I mean, you give Cody a rub too, you know. Yep. Uh, it's going to be entertaining, but I think I I was like you. I thought uh, it ain't going to happen. I think with you giving a guy $30 million, you're going to expect something. Should be very interesting to see what happens there uh, uh, as, far, as far as that, can, that goes. How many people fit in Philadelphia the stadium? Yeah. About 60, 65, I think, um, for, for concerts. Football. Oh, for, for football, I think it's 75, I think. Okay, so now you put chairs on the floor. You're going to have over a hundred. They were saying they're going to only, because of the stage, they're only going to have, I think, 65,000 available. Unless they, they cut back on the stage, I guess. They could have more. Yeah. What would you do? 
yeah, I would cut back on the stage. I mean, money is money, right? I mean, shit. Right, right, right. Because remember last year, the stage was like so big that it cut off a, a quarter of the stadium. Yeah, yeah. You don't want that. It was like a 50 yard walk. Yeah, that too. Yeah, you don't need that. Make it yeah. all seats. Yeah. Now, getting back to Jericho, he does yeah. fight six of the NWO, lose. Loses, doesn't win the Cruiserweight Championship. But it kind of starts a feud with Nick Patrick. What was the idea behind this? Basically a feud with a referee, because they do have a match, too, at World War III. It, trying to get heat on Nick and uh, using Chris as an instrument to do it. Because, you know, Nick ended up being a vital role for the NWO. So the heel ref, yep. Yeah. So did he mind it though? Because it's like, hey, you're here, we're gonna have you against six, but oh, by the way, you're gonna start feuding with the referee Nick Patrick. I'm sure he did. I mean, I would, everybody would, but he's a smart guy, very smart. Uh probably one of the smartest guys ever in the wrestling industry. I'm he not only made the best of it, he made it people talking about it. He could have went in there and sandbagged it. He did a hell of a job. You know? Yep. So. Put it over, for sure. Uh, now, he eventually, when 97 kind of rolls around, he does become Cruiserweight Champion. He wins it on a live event, like a house show event, and he beats six for the title. Any reason behind, like, house show wins for titles? Like, why do that? Not on TV. Okay. This has been my thought, and I don't know why they don't do this to this day. When we were in Florida, and Texas, Texas did this also. We would go to a house show and film a house show with a match belt switched, show it on TV, and people would say, oh, wow, the belt switched in Orlando. We, we better go to the show. Right. You know, it's a way, just a, another way to create fans' interest in that specific market. Now, because they don't go back to towns very often, I can see why they don't do it now. But it wouldn't hurt once in a while to do it. I, I definitely, definitely agree. It, and you, you do see people like, oh, wow, maybe I need to go to the house shows. They're going to do title changes on house shows. They, they, they actually mean something here. Right, right. So he does go back and forth with Alex Wright over the Cruiserweight title. They switch hands a few times. Him and Eddie Guerrero have a little bit of a feud. Him and Rey Mysterio have a feud. So he's basically kind of right in the Cruiserweight division, but right in the thick of it with all the top guys and all the top stars in that division, even Prince Ikea, even uh, maybe a little bit of Disco Inferno sprinkled in, but he's basically, Juventud Guerrero, of course, he's basically kind of going to be eventually like the, the lead horse of the Cruiserweight division, right? In, in your mind? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was a good-looking young boy, uh, athletic, smart, uh, creative, I can't say enough good things about him. When you look at what was going on with WCW, obviously the NWO was killing it. Scott Hall is backstage, and there was some reports, even in Jericho's book, that him and Hall didn't really get along. What was the beef about backstage with Scott Hall and Chris Jericho? Scott had a way of getting under people's skins. He would rib on the square. Do you know what I mean? Like... Uh, Suppose something, you you went to do something and you threw a guy in a corner, we'll say, and 
you went to do something and it it screwed up. Scott would say, oh, that was a good move. I've never seen that before. You know, that kind of shit. <laughs> yeah. So he was that kind of shit disturber. Uh, it, ribbon on the square. But you had to fire back at Scott. You know, you just couldn't let him get to you because when he did get to you, he stayed on you. He knew he had you. With Jericho, he then puts him over on TV when he's not supposed to. So Jericho gets a win. Why does he rib him behind the scenes and then on, on TV, super nice to him and puts him over and probably gives him the biggest win of his career up until that point? I think he did it to take the heat off of himself with Chris. Interesting. Because am I correct? He was not supposed to win, right? I mean, that, that was yeah. all all just changing on the spot. That was that was Scott. Scott and being Scott. Scott saw that not only that, Scott saw that the kid was going to be a star. That's one thing about Scott Hall. He knew talent. Look at the guys he made. Six. Jericho. He made a lot of people. And he could do it without hurting himself. When you look at Jericho here at this point, He's going to become basically the lead heel for the Cruiserweight division. He's going to beat Hooventut. He's going to unmask Hooventut. He's going to have the feud with Ray. He's going to injure his knee, steal, you know, steal his uh, knee brace. Uh, the Prince, Prince Ikea's like little dress thing. I mean, he's going to be like the, the collector, if you will, of these guys. He's going to have Hoovy's mask. You know, he's going to have the dress. He's going to have the knee brace. He's going to basically be a cocky heel and collect all the stuff. Is that your idea or his idea? Or you guys are collaborating on what you want that him was to be? His his idea. That was his idea. That's why I said he was very smart. So he comes to you and you and you you love his stuff. So you said, do it, go for it. Yeah. Just that easy. You just collab with the guys. Different than today, it seems like. If it's if it's a good idea, who cares whose idea it was? It was good, and when he came out, what was the his bodyguard, the guy that yeah. was the ring? Ralphus. Ralphus. Yeah, God. that was his idea too, and the personal security and the other guy, the Jericho Ninja. That would that's all him. Yeah. <laughs> and Ralphus really was the truck driver, right? Yeah. Nice guy. Yeah, very nice. Who was the other guy, the Jericho Ninja? Who Was that another truck driver or something? It was a, uh, one of the guys that helped, I believe, put up the ring. I'm not 100%, but I believe he uh, That's helped. That's awesome. So Jericho himself. basically is like, hey, you guys want to be on TV? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that, so good. Uh, Ralph is in the, the Jericho personal security. Great stuff. With Jericho, he becomes such a, like, huge heel i think he made malenko into one of the most revered baby faces you had because they hated him so much and they wanted malenko to get the comeuppance on him right i mean that's what it seemed like yeah it, it and you hit it right on the head he uh he absolutely and he did it in the different ways by being so cocky i mean he played that role terrifically. He's like uh, a Robert De Niro. He can play any role. Comedy, straight ass, hard, uh, hard ass. He's, he's terrific. That is so true because you can hate him one minute and be laughing at him the next. And then the next minute you think, wow, this guy, I have so much respect for him. He's such a great wrestler. Like there's so many different parts of him. Yeah, yeah. And then he starts doing the man of a thousand four holds, making fun of Dean Malenko's the man of a thousand holds. Yeah. And then has that awesome thing on Nitro where he's taken out and he's going arm drag. You know, he's got the list and they go to commercial yeah. and they come back and he's still reading them off. Great stuff. That's all him too. Him kind of just creating his own stuff. Yeah, yeah. Shouldn't you, though, be taking credit, though? You know, saying, like, hey, uh, I'm the one who created this stuff. You can't give no. Jericho credit. No. <laughs> First of all, be lying. And second of all, it was him. I mean, 
a good idea. The more smart people you have around you, the better off you're going to be. You know what I mean? Yep. And he he was smart coming in as a basically a rookie. He just doesn't surprise me. He made to where he is today. No, but the length that he's made, kept on top and draw money has. Not many people have been able to change with the times like he did. Totally, totally agree. And the feud with Malenko just gets Malenko over to another level where we're like, man, what a freaking pop. When he wins that uh, Battle Royal at uh, Slamboree 98, when he's pretending he's a Cyclope and he takes off the, the mask, man, that pop is just gigantic because they want Jericho, who's been making fun of all the other guys in the ring the whole time and making fun of the division. They just want him to get his comeuppance, and Jericho's reaction to it is great. Yeah, and he, he just knew... He just knew how to get it done. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And he was a thinker. He was a thinker. He was like, you know, Scott and Kevin and uh, Conan and guys like that. He was a smart, smart guy. So basically, he's going to go back and forth with Malenko, but still few with Ray, still few with Hoovy. I mean, it's going to be based, basically he's the big heel of the division, the big dog, and he's kind of got all these other guys shooting with him. The Malenko feud was was great, making fun of his dad, making fun of you know his brother, just making fun of anything and everything, and that was just him being a great heel. Jericho-holics, remember he had that awesome catchphrase, yeah. Jericho-holics anonymous. He was just coming up with so much great stuff there. He was like just it's almost like he couldn't stop. Then he was doing the conspiracy theory stuff where he was saying he was screwed and he, he'd go to the White House. I mean, he was just on fire. Yeah. Yeah. Is he one of the most creative guys you've ever like worked with as far as like coming up with ideas for his own stuff? Yeah. Who else would be up there with him? You think like Raven or something Scott, like that? Scott Hall. Nash. course hogan yep <laughs> you know but do you think do you think jericho should be a booker like today yes he'd have some good ideas yes he does now in wcw they always say they got the glass ceiling you know you're like hey benoit eddie jericho didn't win the world title there but they won the world title in the wwe eventually is that true? Is there a glass ceiling in WCW? Despite Jericho being one of the most over heels, he's never going to quite get to where he needs to be? Yeah. Yeah. Why is that? The checks that the North Tower are looking at. People so, don't understand how Eric had a fight claw with them. You know, they owned the wrestling company. And Eric really had a fight in Claw against the North Tower. And he did a pretty amazing job. So if they say, hey, Jericho's only making 300 grand, um, Goldberg is making 3 million, we can't have this go on. I mean, Goldberg should beat him every time. He's making more money. Yeah. Yeah. Shouldn't they not be meddling in wrestling stuff, though? Yeah, of course, of course they shouldn't be, but they own the company. I mean, look at what, until Eric got there, look what, how messed up it was. Jim Hurd never knew anything about wrestling. Kip Fry. We had a, another guy, I forget his name. Red-headed guy, knew nothing, and came up with stuff. He, until Eric got there, he put his foot down, it was the wilderness. 
because Jericho's going to win the TV title. There's going to be Stevie Ray for it. So it's like, okay, maybe he's getting the ascension up. But then it's like he's calling out Goldberg, which is awesome, hilarious. You know, he's got this security. He's calling it, which is obviously to make fun of Jer- uh, Goldberg when Goldberg comes out with that security in the back. And he's making fun of Goldberg's entrance, but he's getting lost and he can't find his way to the ring. I mean, he's, he's calling him out, calling him Greenberg. He's beating the midget Goldberg. Who, who's obviously was just a fake Goldberg, not Goldberg, but a, the original fake yeah. Goldberg, and he beats him. I mean, all this awesome stuff, and then it leads to them not wrestling. Weird. Well, he didn't want to put him o- Goldberg over. Everybody thought that wasn't it. He wanted to build it up where he was interfering with Goldberg. I found this out later. Then he actually wanted Goldberg to spare him out of his boots. What an idea, huh? I found this out years later. What an idea. Yeah. You know, he spared him out of his boots. I love that. Yeah. But why wouldn't... Goldberg just do a three minute squash or whatever because Jericho didn't care. Like you could beat him, you'd beat him up. Because he just didn't want to go in there and do it for no reason. He had put a lot of thought and effort into his character. Yeah, he, he'd do the job in three minutes, but he wanted to do it his way to get the heat on him. So when he, he did get spared out of his boots, it'd be the talk of wrestling. I just feel like, man, what a missed opportunity because everyone was loving that feud. Goldberg was getting over as a face. Jericho was getting over big time as a heel. I know he wasn't necessarily on Goldberg's level, but Goldberg was squashing guys way worse than Jericho. You know what I mean? He's beaten Jerry Flynn five times, so he could have beaten Jericho too. Weird. Yeah. Yeah. No offense to Jerry Flynn. Love the guy, but you know what I mean? Like Jericho is above him for sure on the on the yeah. big right. Right. Thing is, okay, so he loses the TV title to Conan. The feud with Goldberg really doesn't have an end. Goldberg does at one point spear him in the aisle way, at least, to, to get yeah. some measure of revenge, but there's no real f- finish to it. So you would think that that was going to bother Jericho, and he mentions that in, in his book. It, that did bother him. It's one of the reasons why he left. He felt like, like uh, if I could be a big draw, I feel like I could do something. I can make money with Goldberg, but he always just hitting that glass ceiling. Wasn't getting the match with Hogan or Sting or whoever. He wasn't getting that feud with Goldberg. You think that's eventually why he why he leaves? Yeah, it, they were keeping it to the themselves. I mean, hey, it was very hard to break into that circle. You know, the Hogan, Nash, Hall, Sting, Luger. Name me some more. It was very hard to break right. into that circle. And they kept it that way. I feel like Jericho was kind of getting more and more bitter towards the end. He was avoiding Bischoff, not wanting to resign. Bischoff kept wanting to resign him. He just kept avoiding him. Wouldn't do it. He has a feud with Perry Saturn going on. His last match would eventually be at a house show July 21st. Him and, and Guerrero loses to Kidman and Mysterio in a tag match, and he's gone. And you're kind of just thinking, like, wow, what could have been with Jericho here in, in July of 99? Because I felt like there was so much more left on the table. Did you feel the same thing when he left? Like, man, we could have yeah. done so much more with him. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think he should have been WWE World Champion? Well, I broke th- that glass ceiling with Benoit beating Sid. Yep. I was hoping that would show them the ceiling could be, they worked hard enough that they could get to just the reward. It is crazy to think like, okay, Benoit, Eddie, you know, the, the radicals end up leaving, go to WWF. But even before that, Big Show leaves and then... Jericho leaves. It's like, wow, the, the young guys are all going to WWF, even though WWF's starting to take over and they're starting to become number one. You guys are losing that young talent that could have been yours. I mean, that that's a huge loss because you, you need that young talent eventually. 
that was a huge hole to fill. They were given the best matches on the card. Yep. You don't fill that hole. Now, Jericho would leave, even though apparently Bischoff maybe have offered him more money. Do you think that it wasn't a case of just money with him? It was a case of, I can do more. Like, I can break that glass ceiling and be a world champion. Like, he had something to prove. I think that, but I also think that Chris, being as smart as he was, is what when he had his meeting with Vince, he was given uh, not just I'll give you an opportunity. He was given an assurance he was going to get that opportunity. When he moves over to WWF and he leaves WCW, it's one of those things where it's like, wow, like that was a big loss for WCW. Even though he wasn't getting a huge push necessarily, it just felt like, man, he was such a great talent. That's a big loss. It was a big loss. All, losing them all was a big loss. Huge. You don't then, fill that holes. And then we'll we'll quickly just kind of go through the rest of his career. Really want to focus on WCW. But when you look at the way he debuts in WWE or WWF at that point, August of 99, and still goes to this day, maybe the greatest debut ever in the history of wrestling. You agree? You're probably right. I never thought of it, but you're probably right. It is crazy because, so, you know, they do the Millennium Man. They're having this countdown for weeks. You don't know who it is. You're assuming it's Jericho. You don't, you, know, you kind of don't know who it is. Then all of a sudden, The Rock is in the middle of a promo. And, oh, there's the, the countdown. The countdown ends when The Rock is in the ring talking. So it's like, wow, you can't get any bigger than that. I mean, geez, the guy's going to debut and come out for The Rock. So not only does that happen, he comes out and cuts this awesome promo. You think that, you know, that, that he's going to, he's scathing the rock. He's owning him. Then the rock has a couple awesome quick one-liners to him. And then he does that boo-boo crybaby face <laughs> where yes. he can't believe the rock. So who are you? And then he's like, what? And he, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. So it was an awesome debut. And he came off as such a good heel in, in it too. Yeah, he did. And he was the first guy to win both belts, right? beat uh, Austin and The Rock in the same night. Yeah. Man, you want to talk about becoming a star in one night, beat those two guys, the two, two of the greatest behind Hogan. It's like, whew, pretty amazing. Right. So if you really just look at his run in, in WWE just quickly, it's like, okay, undisputed champion, three-time world champion. He was the, when they had the WCW title, he's a WCW champion there. Intercontinental champion, U.S. champion, European champion, hardcore champion, tag team champion, world tag team champion he wins the queen's cup um he's in all these tournaments he's a grand slam champion he's a slammy award winner just every title and everything you could possibly do in WWE, he did it so not only did he break the ceiling he broke it and, and exploded it yeah destroyed it destroyed the ceiling and it's just one of those things you're like oh man wcw you had arguably you know, one of the biggest stars of all time. Look what WWE did with him. You know what I mean? Just a big what if. Yeah. So really, when you look at that, okay, so he leaves WWE, goes to New Japan Pro Wrestling in, in the late 2000s, basically 2018 on. And they do huge houses. I mean, they were like breaking some records. New Japan World was the new streaming service. And once he was announced he was part of Wrestle Kingdom, that became a, a huge seller. So he kind of proved that not only can I be a success in WWE and be this huge success, internationally, again, I could prove I'm a big success. He kind of laid the groundwork right then and there when he did the Alpha Omega thing with Kenny Omega, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Whether people realize it or not, that laid the groundwork for All In and for AEW. It sure did. It sure did. And it opened that relationship for AEW and New Japan. 100%. And if you look at it, too, it's like, oh, man, Vince did such a good job with Jericho. Except for probably should have just held on to him forever and not let him go. Because that ended up kind of hurting him a little bit. That, you know, you have another company out there 
now now it and, and now it looks okay because Triple H kind of righted the ship and they're doing great. But for a while there was like, wow, they're taking away some money and some business away from WWE here. They shouldn't have let Jericho go. He was he still had some miles left on the tank. Yeah. It would be great to see what Hunter would have done with Jericho. And sometimes he's making some very positive comments. I feel like he still wants to find out what Hunter would do with him if he came back, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at it, he creates Fozzie to obviously this is in the 2000s when he was in WWE, but creates Fozzie, his own rock and roll band. They tour the world. They're great. If nobody's seen them live, they're great. He, he's doing the AEW thing, AEW, their first world champion, and really kind of just laid the groundwork for what would be AEW. You had fans that were laps fans that were watching. So you needed a big star to be your first champion, right? I mean, it just makes perfect sense. Yeah, it made perfect sense. Then you have the Jericho Cruz and he became Ring of Honor world champion. I mean, just in, insane what he's done in the business, music career, TV career, movie career. He actually has a documentary now that's out called The Death Tour, which is about the Canadian indie scene and how basically you could almost die doing the tour because you're traveling on ice and freezing cold weather and things. So right. he just he doesn't stop. He does TV shows, um, movies. He just doesn't stop. Books. His books are always number one bestsellers. Yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't fault them in anything. And that's why going back to what we say and the people booing him, look at all the entertainment he's given them over the last, what, 40 years? Yep. And not only that, whenever a wrestler has a GoFundMe or a wrestler needs money or a wrestler died, yeah. I don't know why people ignore this. You can't, you just should, this shows humanity and shows you how nice of a guy he is. Kamala was sick. Oh, here's five ah, grand. This yeah. guy's sick. Here's 10 grand. It's like, this guy is like the nicest guy as far as like a, his fellow wrestlers I've ever seen in my life. Me too. Me too. Have you ever even heard of another wrestler? Do I mean, you can see, okay, a few bucks here or there, whatever, maybe 5,000, 10,000. I mean, he's loading these guys. Huh? It's crazy. I mean, they, they need it and they deserve it, but it's insane how nice he's been. Yeah, the only one that I can tell you that does things like that is The Rock. Right. Like, he's bought Haku a truck. He bought uh, downtown Bruno a truck in a house. You know, he bought his mother a house. Uh, that doesn't count. But he's bought. He's taken care of other guys too. But Chris has gone way above anybody else doing anything like that. Yeah, I feel like people forget that. Like you ignore certain things, you believe certain rumors, but you don't yeah. re believe concrete, real facts that are out there. The guy is one of the nicest guys, helping his fellow wrestlers that could ever exist ever yeah well we don't we're a conspiracy theory world now and it, we're, we're always looking for negatives we want to tear people down even if it's not nowhere near truth crazy not only with jericho as far as just his career Became a number one podcaster as well, uh, number one author. Uh, you know all this other stuff that he's been able to do. Just a remarkable career. What What do you think is the legacy of Chris Jericho when you look at it? I wouldn't object for him to be on Mount Rushmore. One of the goats. Yeah, I wouldn't object. He had quite a career, quite a run, right. and just, I don't know, just remarkable what he was able to do in the business and to think that he's literally wrestled everywhere and you know, became a top dog in AEW, obviously, New Japan Pro Wrestling, WWE, it's top of the mountain. Everywhere he put his foot, he became the top guy. So as far as this episode, let's wrap it up and just want to mention just real uh, briefly here. Ice Train has passed away. WCW yeah. superstar Ice Train passed away. Harold Hogue, he was only 56 years old, had the chance to interview him once. What a nice guy. What a sweetheart. What do you think about the passing of uh, Ice Train? Horrible. Horrible. Too young. Way too young. And he yeah. looked like he was in tremendous shape. I saw him at a convention yeah. two years ago, I think it was. He just looked like in awesome shape. Yeah, he looked in the best shape of his life. 
crazy. RIP Ice Train, poor Ice Train. But let's uh, wrap this bad boy up. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Kevin, what do you got going on in this crazy world? I'm going up to New York Saturday for a virtual signing on Long Island. And uh, the book, you know, we talk about old school. Yep. Uh, it's t- taken off a little. And uh, I think uh, I someone mentioned something to me that Reddit friend of mine said, it reminds him of a mixture of good fellows meets wrestling. That was a good take. Yeah, I like that. Definitely. Yeah. 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 But a lot of that is true. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so good fellows or not, it, a lot of it is true. Yeah. Most of it is. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody out there for listening. See you right back here next time. Have a good one, folks.